Hello everyone. In this video I want to discuss Sir Thomas Brown, primarily his work The Religio Medici, uh, with some attention near the end to his other masterwork, The Urn Burial. Thomas Brown was born in London in 1605, in fact very close to the place where John Milton was to be born about three years later, uh, and in 1623 uh, went up to Oxford University where he studied, developed an interest uh, in medicine, and so uh, when he left Oxford he traveled on the continent of Europe where the uh, main centers were for the study of that subject, eventually took his medical degree from Leiden and returned to England, uh, eventually settling in Norwich, where he lived out, uh, lived for the rest of his life. He was, uh, during the turbulent years of the 1630s, 40s, and 50s, during the Civil War and the Interregnum, he lived a peaceful, retired life. In uh, 1671, after the restoration of King Charles II in 1660, 1671, uh, he was on hand for uh, the king's visit to Norwich. And uh, since they needed a, um, a prominent citizen uh, to be knighted, um, Sir Thomas Brown fit the bill. And so in 1671, he became Sir Thomas Brown. Uh, and then eventually uh, passed away in 1682, famously on his birthday. Um, I, he's best known, as I say, for these two works, the Religio Medici, or uh, to give it its medieval pronunciation, the Religio Medici, and also his later work, Urn Burial. To turn to the Religio Medici, uh, it's a work that was written fairly early in Thomas Brown's life. In fact, in the second section, of the work. He mentions that he has not yet been married, and so um, uh, it was, however, proved immensely popular and was revised uh, during his lifetime. It was initially published surreptitiously without uh, Thomas Brown's permission, and so uh, because of that he decided that he wanted at least to exert some authorial control over the text that people were reading, and so he had it then published uh, under his own um, with his own ability to edit the work to make sure that it accurately reflected what it was he was trying to say. Uh, the Religio Medici is, as its title indicates, a work that discusses the religious views of a doctor, and here we might contrast it with Burton's, with another one of the uh, absolutely masterful prose works of the 17th century, Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, in which Burton makes much of the fact that he is a divine or a priest writing about a medical topic. Here we have a uh, medical man, a medicus, uh, writing about matters religious, which shows us the extent to which people could in those days still be generalists. Now with our uh, now in our time of hyper-specialization, uh, uh, such things are very difficult to do. But in the 17th century, uh, before the sciences had subdivided uh, into all kinds of, into a dizzying array of specializations and, um, and split uh, radically from the humanities, you could still have uh, this kind of thing written. Um, and uh, Burton writes it extraordinarily well. It was, uh, it, its uh, purpose seems to be uh, twofold. Uh, to, to some extent, it's uh, Thomas Brown's coming to terms with his own religious belief as he's entering early middle age, perhaps, uh, trying to settle his religious opinions and trying to feel out precisely what he thinks about things. But also, uh, it's important that it's written in the 17th century, as we mentioned at the beginning of this series of lectures. And that's a period of time in which everything is coming into question. In fact, even the existence of God himself is coming into question. And so uh, all sorts of religious skepticism is arising. And Thomas Brown, on the one hand, is in fact a man who is current on 17th century science. Uh, so um, what he's trying to, and on the other hand, he's a deeply religious person. And so Part of what he seems to be doing in the Religio Medici is to uh, orient the Christian faith in this period of increasing doubt and skepticism. 
uh, a word about the prose style. We had uh, mentioned before that there are two main styles of prose, the Senecan or paratactic, that's where you take uh, relatively simple independent clauses and pile them up one after another, and named for the, uh, because it's a hallmark of the Roman philosopher Seneca's prose style. And then there's the Ciceronian practiced by the great uh, Roman senator and uh, maker of speeches uh, and attorney, Cicero, uh, who loves nothing more than to heap up dependent clause upon dependent clause upon dependent clause, all of these clauses in some kind of subordinate relationship to everything else. And then finally, at the end of the sentence, you get the gist of the whole that he's trying to say. And we had mentioned that Burton, for instance, is a, well, whereas Bacon is a practitioner of the Senecan style, more or less, Burton uh, tends toward the long complex and Ciceronian, though he does, uh, he does uh, exemplify a mixture of the two. Uh, Brown is even more a mixture, a, a fine and balanced mixture of these two styles, and um, a very pleasing, and, and that allows his prose a very pleasing variety of sentence structures, which is one of the things that makes his work stand out as an absolute model and exemplar of English prose style, uh, particularly during this period. Uh, another thing we can say about his um, prose style, and that is it's um, it, particularly in the urn burial, it's elegiac nature. The uh, and, it's, and as I say, it's it's adapted primarily to the urn burial because that work is a work which is largely concerned with death. So this elegiac nature, this 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 consciousness uh, that he is lamenting things that have passed away. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, there is a third quality, and that's the magnificent rhythmic quality of his prose that achieves a kind of rhythmic certainty that you get in the finer passages of the King James Bible. I'm thinking of uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, for instance, in the King James Bible, or some of those fine, uh, the book of Job as another good example, just the sure sense of English rhythm that the translators had there that made the King James Bible so fit a document to read in pub on public occasions for centuries after it was published in 1611, another fine text of the 17th century, one might point out. So all of these qualities uh, mixed together, which is um, one of the hallmarks, I think, of, of, of Thomas Brown, at any rate, is this mixture of things. He's constant, well, I shouldn't say constantly, but, but um, he, uh, on several important occasions, in the Religio Medici in particular, reminds his reader that man is an amphibian. Man is two things. He's both a physical creature and partakes of the physical world, but he's also a spiritual creature who is uh, made, created in the image of God. So man is both divine and human and participates both of heaven, in heaven and uh, the physical world that animals and other physical substances inhabit. Uh, the same thing is true of his prose style. It's just this wonderful uh, complex mixture of things, and one must always remember that about Thomas Brown. He's always aware. Everything is always complex with him. He's a man of science and a man of faith. He, his anthropology is uh, consists of these two main principles, that human beings are created in the image of God and that they are also uh, animals. And um, we get and and we get the sense that uh, he is uh, interested in matter scientific, and yet he's also an old-fashioned humanist who has uh, a fine understanding of the general scope of human culture. So uh, Thomas Brown is as wonderfully uh, gives us a wonderfully complex response to the wonderful complexities of life all around us. About um, the religio medici. It's divided into two sections, as we said. The first contains a general account of the author's religious beliefs and um, talks about some of the ideas of central importance in that belief and also includes how he comports himself toward others. But the second portion uh, focuses on the main 
uh, Christian virtue of charity or love. And that's charity or love broadly understood because while he talks in that section, he discusses things like marriage and friendship and then general charity towards uh, others, both believers and non-believers. Uh, what I want to talk about are hallmarks of the work generally that one finds in both of these sections and the hallmarks and one could find others of course but the hallmarks that uh, occur to me as I'm reading Thomas Brown are four primary ones. First of all he strikes me as a particularly optimistic person. There's a kind of good-natured optimism that runs throughout Thomas Brown's writing as we will see. There's also an old-fashioned humanism. Even though he's a man of science, he's also a person who is entirely comfortable in the grand, in, in the long stream of Western philosophy and culture, going back to the ancient Greeks and Romans carrying through the Middle Ages and on into the Renaissance. There is, his, his mind seems also marked by genuine kindness and charity. Rather than being a, um, shall we say, a resolute uh, fighter and defender of the ramparts, what we find is a, a generally good-natured attitude toward other human beings, even those he disagrees with. So there is a kind, there's a genuine kindness and charity about him. And that's closely associated, it seems to me, with the fourth hallmark of his style, and that is his humility and self-deprecation, that uh, he doesn't think too highly of himself and therefore he's able to think highly of other human beings. There's obviously other things one could say about other qualities of mind one can find in Thomas Brown, but these are the four that, that, that uh, seem, that, that stand out to me as, shall we say, uh, at the heart of Brown and his writing. When I talk about optimism, and the way in which Brown uh, views the world generally, optimistically. He has a uh, fairly happy um, attitude toward the world as a whole. Uh, and think about passages of the sort that we find on, um, oh, let's say, if, if one looks uh, early in the work, in the Religio Medici, on page uh, 335, the left-hand column, about the uh, middle of the page, um, where he is uh, generally, um, he is content and happy to look at the world in the way that others have looked at it before. In other words, uh, here is a man who is willing to accept the goodness of those who have come before him and their ability to understand the world around us uh, so that he doesn't have to constantly reinvent the wheel. And this, by the way, ties in very nicely as well with his humility. He doesn't feel as if Thomas Brown has been given all knowledge and wisdom and therefore has to develop his own system. He's perfectly happy to accept what others have said, to interpret the world in the way that other wise people have done so. Uh, as he says in the middle of the left-hand column on page uh, 335, in philosophy where truth seems double-faced, uh, there is no man more paradoxical than myself. Philosophy, and again, I remind you that in those days philosophy would have encompassed natural philosophy, that is the study of nature and what we would call biology, physics, and so on, the sciences in short. There is no man more paradoxical than myself, but in divinity that is, in religion, religious studies. But in divinity, I love to keep the road. That is the road that has been staked out before him by the church and by the theologians that are recognized as great through time. And though not in an implicit, yet a humble faith, I follow the great wheel of the church by which I move, not reserving any proper poles or motion from the epicycle of my own brain. So it doesn't want to be highly idiosyncratic and individualistic in his understanding of religion. And this probably is because when it comes to religion, 
ways of knowing are different. When it comes to religion, one can't really run experiments in the same way that one can in the sciences. And so one relies on one's own understanding less. And one relies, uh, religion is largely a matter of what is given uh, by God to human beings. And so one uh, necessarily, um, at least in Brown's way of thinking, one necessarily in humility needs to accept what is given. Uh, we find this sort of thing a couple of pages later, the top of the left-hand column on page uh, 337. Uh, we do too narrowly define the power of God, restraining it to our capacities. We don't want to constrain God by what we think is possible or by what we think our in impression of God is, but we want to take, we should take him as he is. I hold, or I believe, that God can do all things. There's a generally optimistic view of God as the creator of the world. How he should work contradictions, I do not understand. This gets back to the old philosophical or religious question, if God can do everything, can he do something that's evil? Or if God is the very definition of what is good, or perhaps uh, even more clearly, if God can do everything, can he make a rock that is so heavy that he can't pick it up? And so on and so on. <laughs> these, uh, these little um, paradoxes. It says, I uh, believe that God can do all things. How he should work contradictions, I do not understand, and yet I dare not deny it. Uh, just because Brown can't understand it. And this is just a wonderful touch of humility here. Uh, and that's so closely tied to his optimism, yet he doesn't want to deny it. Simply because Brown doesn't understand it doesn't mean that Brown may not be mistaken. Brown's mind is not the, is not the definition of truth. Uh, perhaps Brown is mistaken. So just because he doesn't understand something doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So wonderful, uh, wonderful shall we say, optimistic view of the word that all things are possible. In other words, all things are possible because all things are possible to God. So wonderful optimism there. And on the same page, uh, where I should say a little further on, on page 42, 342, um, the bottom of the left-hand column, um, and the whole question of salvation, right? He's not a... Um, He's not a timorous Calvinist, uh, terrified of damnation, shall we say. Um, on the other hand, he is not supremely confident, as some other Protestant sects are, of their salvation. He's too humble for that, and yet uh, generally optimistic uh, that he will be saved. Again, I am confident and fully persuaded, yet dare not take my oath of my salvation. I am, as, uh, I am, as it were, sure, and do believe without all doubt that there is such a city as Constantinople, yet for me to take my oath thereon were a kind of perjury, because I hold no infallible warrant from my own sense to confirm me in the certainty thereof. And truly, though many pretend to an absolute certainty of their salvation, yet when a humble soul shall contemplate her own unworthiness, she shall meet with many doubts and suddenly find how little we stand in need of the precept of St. Paul, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, that which I, is the cause of my election I hold to be the cause of my salvation, which is the mercy and beneplacket of God before I was with the foundation of the world. So uh, wonderful use of analogy there. Uh, generally speaking, it sort of is an experiential matter. Uh, Brown is sure of his salvation uh, because, not because of anything he has done, but because God is good and loving. He is certain of his salvation in the same way that he's certain that there's a city of uh, there's a city called Constantinople. He's never been to Constantinople, so he himself can't be 100% certain in the sense that you are of something that you have experienced. Yet, yet, um, he's certain of his salvation in that um, records attest, particularly the scriptures attest, that if one loves God, one will be saved. So there is uh, uh, those hallmarks of, of Brown's optimism, and we'll see that kind of optimism reflected in other passages that we look at, even if I use them to adduce others, other qualities of his writing. And speaking of other qualities of his writing, I uh, mention 
the old-fashioned humanism of Brown, his, um, his being at home in the grand tradition of Western thought. And so we might look at uh, page 338 um, on the bottom of the right-hand column, where he, uh, where he subscribes to the idea, and this is an idea that goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks, of a great chain of being. Uh, roughly speaking, the great chain of being goes like this, and it's an idea that the Christian Middle Ages took over from the ancient Greeks and Romans. The idea is this, if we can Christianize, if we can emphasize the uh, Christian aspects of the idea. The idea is this. When God spoke to Mer Moses from the burning bush, God identified himself as, essentially by name as I am that I am. Uh, on that occasion, God did not say I am love or I am holy. He said I am that I am. What this means then has generally been understood to mean that God is existence, right? The ends of St. Thomas Aquinas. And that has interesting implications because God is the thing that exists and that exists by himself. Uh, everything else that exists exists because God made it, but he is self-existent. self -existent. Um, that uh, he is the, the being and the ground of being of everything else which exists. What that means is that when he creates things, he brings them into existence because that's the kind of father he is. In the same way that any father you're aware of passes on his traits to his children, and so his children look like him. In the same way, God, who is existence, when he creates things, he gives them the property of existing. That may seem trivial, but in fact, in a way, it's rather profound because it explains how things that exist exist in the way that God exists, right? And that has other implications as well. So that uh, God, uh, the, the more like God a thing is, the closer to God it is, as it were. And the less like God's existence a thing is, the farther away, we might say, for want of more precise language, the farther away from God it is. So, for instance, God, we can say that God exists, all right. We can take something else that simply exists, and that's about all we can say of it. And we can, um, now let's take for an example, sand. Now, I'm not, um, I'm not very precise in my scientific thinking on these matters, so the examples I give are going to be rather rough and crude, but I hope that they will convey the idea that I'm trying to explain. Uh, let's say sand. Well, we can't say much more about sand than that it exists, right? It's just a substance and there it is. If you want to get hyper-technical, you can say uh, the basic atoms uh, of an element, let's say hydrogen, just simply simply exists, and that's about all you can say about it. All right, so sand, of course, they didn't know about atoms in those days uh, in the sense that we understand them chemically. So we'll just take, for them, uh, sort of a basic, simple substance would be something like sand. Okay, it's like God in that it exists. There you go. Uh, well, we can take something a little more complex, let's say a, uh, minerals, um, uh, which exist, uh, which consist of various substances, perhaps a little more complex than sand, though here I show, no doubt show my scientific ignorance. Uh, it's a little closer to God. We can say that it exists and that it's somewhat uh, complicated and interesting. Uh, we can move higher still up a chain of being, ever closer to God. We can take, uh, let's say, the very simplest forms of life. Uh, let's take something like grass. Again, I'm using um, examples that would have been commonsensical to people in Brown's day. No doubt we can find single-celled uh, organisms that are simpler than grass, but these wouldn't have been available, of course, to Brown's a way of thinking because of their limited technological instrumentation available to them. So let's take something like grass, a uh, relatively simple organism, uh, has roots and it has uh, leaves 
and that's about it. Um, but it's so it's like sand in that it exists, but it's more like God in that it exists and it is alive. All right, well, we can move up from grass up through various plants and we can eventually arrive at something like trees. Trees are like sand in that they exist. They're like grass in that they're alive, but they're more complex than grass in the sense that they have roots, they have uh, they have a bowl or a trunk, they have branches, they have twigs. At the end of these twigs you have leaves and so on. And they have flowers and seed, which I suppose grass does, but uh, trees as well. So that they are perhaps, again, roughly we can say more complex than grass. And uh, therefore they move higher up the chain of being of simple plant life. At this point then we can uh, move into animal life, something like an earthworm, like grass it exists, I'm sorry, like sand it exists, like grass or trees it exists and has life, uh, but it now has a soul, it has an anima, it, it is able to move itself. By the way, the old Latin uh, word anima or animus means soul, and uh, it is under and it was generally understood that the soul is that thing which confers the power of motion. That's why you can talk about a drawing, which is still on the page, but you can talk about an animation, which takes that drawing and allows it to move, uh, and conferring upon it an anima or an animus, as it were, giving it a soul. So, animals then are beings uh, which exist like uh, sand and that are alive like plants, but unlike plants they have a soul that allows them to move themselves. So we can think of a very basic animal like an earthworm, let's say. Uh, very low on the chain of being, though higher on the chain of being than sand and than grass or trees. And then it's easy enough to conceive then moving up the chain of being among the animals. We can think of a goldfish, for instance, but even higher than that, we can think of your puppy dog who has some emotions and can respond to you emotionally and so on. And up and up you go the chain of being until you get to human beings. Uh, and they are created different from the other animals that God created on the sixth day in that God created them like the animals, giving them a soul because human beings can move themselves, but in addition conferring upon them a spiritus, a spirit, uh, cognate with our word respiration, breathing as God breathed his spirit into the, clay of into the clay of the ground in order to create man. Man is both an animal, but he also has that godlike nature, that spiritus. And so we move up and up the chain of being. Incidentally, in the Christian Middle Ages, that man was right at the middle of the chain of being because above man then there were the various orders of angels and seraphim and cherubim and angels and archangels and principalities and thrones and dominions and powers that you can read about in the New Testament. And if you want a detailed discussion of this, you can go back to uh, Dionysius the Areopagite, an ancient, an ancient Greek uh, theologian, supposedly uh, the Dionysus that St. Paul converted uh, on the um, Areopagus as described in Acts chapter 16 or 17 when he's visiting Athens. Uh, probably not. It's, it's probably a text, as linguistic evidence indicates, was written later than that. But at any rate, uh, he, he wrote, a, among other uh, fascinating works, he wrote a book called The Celestial Hierarchy in which he describes all of the different angelic beings and their different orders and so on. And up, and up we go up the chain of being. Uh, so human beings are like sand and like plants and like animals. Oh, well, they're like sand in that they exist. They're like plants in that they exist and have life. Uh, they're like animals in that they exist, have life, and have a soul, but they're more and more like God in that we exist, have life, have a soul, but we have a spirit which is created in the image of God. And then when you move into the realm of the angelic, then you have come to beings that don't really have physical bodies and senses that we do, though here I would refer you as well to that contemporary of Thomas Brown, John Milton, who takes up this matter in the... Uh, magnificent epic, Paradise Lost, but at any rate, uh, they, they leave the physical behind them. 
and become essentially all spirit and so on until we come uh, finally at the very apex of the chain of being the summum or the highest, the summum bonum of Aristotle or the highest good, uh, which according to the Christian tradition is God himself, uh, the very source and high point of the chain of being. Well, this, as I say, was an old, old uh, tradition that had been developed by the ancient Greeks and added on to by subsequent generations of thinkers. And it's an idea that Thomas Brown adopts as he adopts sort of the old, uh, the sort of traditional culture. Uh, let's see. Um, now, this is at the bottom of the right-hand column on page 338. Now, if you demand my opinion in metaphysics of their natures, I confess them uh, very shallow, most of them in a negative way like that of God, or in a comparative between ourselves and fellow creatures. For there is in this universe a stair, or manifest scale, scala, uh, being, going back to the old Greek word for ladder, a manifest scale of creatures rising not disorderly or in confusion, but with a comely method and proportion. Between creatures of mere existence and things of life, there is a large disproportion of nature. Between plants and animals or creatures of sense, a wider difference. Between them and man, a far greater. And if the proportion hold one between man and angels, there should be yet a greater. We do not comprehend their natures who retain the first definitions of porphyry and distinguish them from ourselves by immortality. For before his fall, his thought, man also was immortal. Yet must we needs affirm that he had a different essence from the angels, having and so on and so on. So in that passage, uh, Thomas Brown is reaffirming his belief in the chain of being. By the way, it's a belief that was a staple of Western thought. Everyone believed this until you get uh, into the middle of the 19th century. Darwin's publication of The Origin of the Species in 1859 uh, gives us a scale of being that is not static. Everything in its well-ordered place and carefully ordained place in the scale of beings, but is a uh, it gives us a view of existence in which organisms move up and down this chain, as it were. So it's a much more dynamic uh, sliding scale and therefore eventually is going to do away with the whole notion of the scale of beings. Um, another example of the, of the uh, sort of traditional nature of some of Brown's way of thinking. Uh, it was found on page 339. This is at the top of the, uh, so the top of the left-hand column, or the um, uh, top of the right-hand column, I should say, on page 339. And this is the old idea of the microcosm, macrocosm, that um, the world is what we call the macrocosm, cosmos uh, being the ancient Greek word for world. By the way, if you're interested in etymology, I point out, since we're talking about Brown as an optimistic writer and thinker, uh, having an optimistic view of the universe, the ancient Greek view of the universe must have been generally optimistic, if we can make such crude generalizations. And that's because they're, one of their words for the universe, cosmos, is related to the um, ancient Greek, uh, one of the ancient Greek words for beauty, from wh whence we derive our word cosmetics, for instance. And that what that shows us is that for the ancient Greeks, the world was a beautiful, harmonious, well-ordered place. Uh, so it is for uh, Brown as well. But even more, the old idea that the cosmos generally, the universe as a whole, is recapitulated in every human being. That is to say, every human being is, as it were, in mic is a microcosm, is in miniature an entire world. We saw John Donne hinting at this idea in his poem, The Good Morrow, that poem in which he says, uh, each of the two lovers is a world. Each of the two lovers, if you recall, is a hemisphere, and each of the two lovers is an entire world, and uh, they fit together as one complete world. Dunn also has a, one of his uh, holy sonnets, which we did not discuss, uh, his holy sonnet, which begins, I am a little world made cunningly. 
That is, that uh, he is an entire microcosm. That uh, since man is the highest of God's creation, that he's the chief thing that God created in the six days of creation, that he summarizes in himself all the rest of the creation. What this means, roughly speaking, here's a crude example of what, or a crude, um, should we say, paraphrase of what this whole notion of microcosm and macrocosm means, and that is that just as the world around us has rivers, so we have rivers running through our bodies. We'll call them the blood vessels. And just as the world around us contains fire as an important element, we have heat generated within us. And just as the world around us uh, shall we say, has living creatures, so you have uh, living cells in different parts of your body that are alive. And just as the universe as a whole, just as the world as a whole has mountains, so you've got bones in your body, and so on and so on, to put it rather crudely. This notion of the macrocosm and microcosm was uh, teased out at great length uh, in various texts of the Renaissance, but, uh, but Brown subscribes to this view, generally speaking. Uh, at the top of page 339, he says, um, uh, or at the bottom of the left column on page 339, that we are the breath and similitude of God, it is indisputable and upon record of Holy Scripture. But to call ourselves a microcosm or little world, I thought it was only a pleasant trip of rhetoric until I started thinking carefully about it and learned and saw that there was real truth therein. For first we are a rude mass, and in the rank of creatures which only are and have a dull kind of being, not yet privileged with life, what we were saying about sand a while ago, or preferred to sense or reason. Next, we live the life of plants, the life of animals, the life of men, and at last, the life of spirits, running on in one mysterious nature those five kinds of existences which comprehend the creatures, not only of the world, but of their of the entire universe. So we sum up within us all of the different orders of creation that exist in the universe. Each human being contains that within himself. And this leads him then on to the idea, this is one of the passages in which he talks about man as an amphibian. Thus man is that great and true amphibian, amphos in Greek meaning both, uh, where we get our word, let's say, ambidextrous. You have literally two right hands. Uh, we are the amphibian. Uh, we are both at home in the spiritual and in the physical world, whose nature is disposed to live not only like other creatures in diverse elements, but in divided and distinguished worlds, and so on. So this nature, uh, this notion of the chain of being that uh, Thomas Brown subscribes to places him uh, within the realm of the traditional. This notion of um, man as a microcosm of the entire universe, or the macrocosm, also a very traditional view uh, that places him as, uh, marks him as a kind of old-fashioned humanist. And um, the um, same sort of thing the, uh, that we find towards the bottom of the right-hand column on page 339. Um, he says, uh, this is the generally uh, old traditional view, what is, the purpose, what is the purpose of human existence? And according to the Christian tradition, the purpose of human existence is to uh, serve God and to worship him. Uh, that God made all things for man is in some sense true, yet not so far as to subordinate the creation of those purer creatures unto ours. Uh, that is, the angels are not subservient to us. Though as ministering spirits they do, and are willing to fulfill the will of God in these lower and sublunary affairs of man. God made all things for himself, and it is impossible he should make them for any other end than his own glory. It is all he can receive, and all that is without himself. So again, this old traditional view that really settles in with the coming of the Middle Ages and has been sort of the traditional anthropology or the traditional view of man, God, and the universe uh, that uh, one finds for centuries before Brown in his humility. He's perfectly happy to accept that view as well. Uh, on to uh, the quality that Brown exhibits of kindness and charity. Uh, an absolutely wonderful uh, passage near the very beginning of the Religio Medici, and that is that um, 
Um, and we'll return to this again when we discuss his humility. Uh, and that is that he says uh, on the bottom of the right-hand column on page 334, I could never divide myself from any man upon the difference of an opinion or be angry with his judgment for not agreeing with me in that from which perhaps within a few days I should dissent myself. I have no, dis I have no genius for disputes in religion, he says. He's not, a, for him, a... Uh, Truth is not a matter to argue and to fight with other human beings about, to be kind and to be gentle with other people, even those with whom you disagree. He says, the, uh, is what he gives us here, the bottom of the right-hand column on page 34, right at the beginning of the Religio Medici, that um, uh, he's not interested in fighting with those that he disagrees with. And again, a, a matter it's because of his general humility, his um, why fight about someone, why fight with someone about a matter that you may come to a different opinion about yourself later? So, um, again, he doesn't identify himself as the source of all truth, and therefore someone disagreeing uh, with what he considers a truth is in some way um, disagreeing fundamentally with Sir Thomas Brown. No, it's um, uh, that Sir Thomas Brown uh, has beliefs, and others may have other beliefs, and he is going to um, respect the other human being nevertheless. Uh, he repeats this, as we will see later on, when he gets appropriately enough to the section on charity. But if we look uh, a little further in the Religio Medici, um, bottom of the right-hand column, in, uh, from the second part uh, about charity, we see uh, him saying, now for that other virtue of charity, without which faith is a mere notion and of no existence, the kind of thing that St. Paul says in that famous 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, that religious faith is in vain if it doesn't have charity. I have ever endeavored to nourish the merciful disposition and humane inclination I borrowed from my parents and regulate it to the written and prescribed laws of charity. And if I hold the true anatomy of myself, if I really understand myself, I am delineated and naturally framed to such a piece of virtue. For I am of a constitution so general that it consorts and sympathizes with all things. And this is true because, as we have said, uh, Brown, in his perceptions, certainly reflects the complexity of the world. Brown is both and. He's, aware, he's alive to the fact that human beings are amphibious creatures, and he is both a man of science and uh, interested, deeply uh, committed to his Christian faith, and so on and so on. Uh, for this reason, he is also charitable because he is so generally interested in everything and generally loves everything and everyone. I have no antipathy. He doesn't react strongly and harshly against anything. I have no antipathy or rather idiosyncrasy in diet, humor, air, or anything. I wonder not at the French for their eating of frogs and snails and toadstools, no, nor at the Jews for eating locusts and grasshoppers, but being among them, make them my common meals, and I find they agree with my stomach as well as theirs, and so on. So uh, again, just this wonderful, good-natured sense of Sir Thomas Brown that he likes everything, and that includes other human beings. Um, and we find the uh, we we find this emphasis on charity as well uh, a little further on on page three forty five, towards the bottom of the right hand column. Uh, one of the and this shows the clear connection between his. Um, charity or his love for other people and his humility. No man, he says, can justly censure or condemn another, because indeed no man truly knows another. If you're less certain about your beliefs and less arrogant about your beliefs, you'll be uh, more patient with others uh, who have different beliefs. Um, but no man can justly censure or condemn another because no man truly knows another. Uh, this I perceive in myself, for I am in the dark to all the world, and my nearest friends behold me but in a cloud. Those that know me but superficially think less of me than I do of myself. Those of my near acquaintance think more. God, who truly knows me, knows I am nothing, for he only 
beholds me and all the world, who looks not on us through a derived ray or a trajection of a sensible species, but beholds the substance without the help of accidents and the forms of things as we see their operations. God sees truly into us, but only God sees truly into us. We human beings have a limited knowledge of one another, and therefore we shouldn't be so quick to condemn one another, uh, particularly those who don't agree with us. So you see that his charity and his love for others here is closely tied to his humility, as love is always closely tied to humility. That's if one can be so fatuous as to talk about one theme that runs through Shakespeare, uh, it would be that. And speaking of his humility, uh, we find uh, lots of examples of that kind of thing in the Religio Medici. On uh, page 335, for instance, um, and we've already discussed this passage, uh, the middle of the left-hand column, when he talks about how when it comes to matters religious, he's not going to reinvent the wheel, as it were. He doesn't think that he himself has all wisdom and understanding, and therefore he is going to uh, carve out his own way in matters religious, and that everyone who's gone before him is wrong. Uh, this is the passage where he says that in um, divinity, I love to keep the road, and though not in an implicit yet a humble faith, I follow the great wheel of the church. All right, so uh, there's his self-deprecation there. On page uh, 337, you see at the, um, um, uh, again, at the top of the left-hand column in the passage we read before, uh, his, his humility and self-deprecating self -deprecating, uh, quality, that um, he believes that God can do all things, and he won't even deny that God can do contradictions. These, uh, he has been told, and the great theologians of the past talk about God's um uh, well, omnipotence, ability to do all things, and therefore uh, he is not going to uh, deny that that is possible, as modern skeptics, even in the 17th century, uh, very well did. Um, one could look again on page uh, 343 uh, in the, pa in the um, passage uh, just before uh, the second part. Uh, this is the passage we looked at when we were discuss when he was discussing his uh, view of his salvation. Again, he doesn't arrogantly assert that he knows he is saved and going to heaven. Um, he is more humble about it than that, more self-deprecating. Uh, and indeed, this is uh, perhaps uh, a knowledge of his own weakness and imperfections here coming to the fore. But at any rate, he certainly understands, uh, he believes that he uh, in his uh, that he will be saved, and yet, and yet he doesn't assert it uh, too strongly. Um, and we find that um, uh, that wonderful passage from the very beginning of the Religio Medici, in which he talks about not arguing with others, you find this um, repeated on page 344, appropriately enough, in the section on charity. On uh, 344, he says at the bottom of the right-hand column, I cannot fall out or contemn a man for an error or conceive why a difference of opinion should divide an affection. For controversies, disputes, and argumentations, both in philosophy and in religion, if they meet with discreet and peaceable natures, do not infringe the laws of charity. In all disputes, so much as there is of passion, so much there is of nothing to the purpose. So the more heated an argument is, the less, um, the less, shall we say, intelligent, uh, the less beneficial, the less useful, shall we say, it becomes in finding truth. And so uh, he doesn't like having disputes with other people. Uh, again, um, he's not uh, out to impose his will upon others. Um, on page 346, the bottom of the left-hand column, uh, emphasis here on friendship here. Um, when I'm, uh, he, he talks about uh, their wonders and true affection. It is a body of enigmas, mysteries, and riddles, uh, one's relationship to other human beings. 
wherein two so become one as they both become two. I love my friend before myself, and yet methinks I do not love him enough. Some few months hence my multiplied affection will make me believe I have not loved him at all. When I'm from him, I'm dead till I be with him. When I'm with him, I'm not satisfied, but would be nearer him still. United souls are not satisfied with embraces, but desire to be truly each other, which, being impossible, their desires are infinite and must proceed without a possibility of satisfaction. So uh, this idea of of genuine love and charity, the kind of thing that Dunn, this approaches the kind of thing that Dunn writes about in his songs and sonnets, this kind of love in, in which people genuinely relate on the level of the spiritual. Uh, and one might look, uh, by the way, at the uh, end of the Religio Medici and uh, close out on this wonderful note of humility. The, um, uh, I'd like to read here um, um, the, 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 final, the entire final paragraph of the Religio Medici. I conclude, therefore, and say, there is no happiness under, or as Copernicus would have it, above the sun, or any cram in that repeated verity and burthen of all the wisdom of Solomon, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. There is no happiness in the world, there is no happiness in the things that the world adores. Aristotle, while he labors to refute the ideas of Plato, falls upon one himself, for his summum bonum is a chimera, and there is no such thing as his happiness. That wherein God himself is happy, the holy angels are happy, in whose defect the devils are unhappy, that is what I call happiness. Whatsoever conduceth unto this may, with an easy metaphor, deserve the name of happiness. Whatsoever else the world calls happiness is to me just a story, just a fairy tale out of Pliny or a tale of Boccaccio or Malsapini, an apparition or neat delusion wherein there is no more of happiness than the name. So again, uh, the clear assertion of his religious beliefs, happiness is what makes God happy um, and what makes the angels happy. That's true and genuine happiness. Anything else is but a fiction. Bless me in this life with but peace of my conscience, command of my affections, the love of thyself and my dearest friends, and I shall be happy enough to pity Caesar. These are, O Lord, the humble desires of my most reasonable ambition, and all I dare call happiness on earth, wherein I set no rule to limit or limit to thy hand or providence. Dispose of me according to the wisdom of thy pleasure. Thy will be done, even though it is in my own undoing. So just a wonderful statement there of his humility. Uh, God's will be done, as he says at the end of the Religio Medici. I would like to turn now briefly to the urn burial, um, which, as its name indicates, is uh, has to do. With, it was written on the occasion of the discovery of a number of urns in rural England that uh, contained uh, the bones of some dead, and who these people were and what their society or civilization was was completely unknown. This was written uh, later than the uh, Religio Medici. This was written in 1658. And uh, the occasion of the work, he outlines in the second paragraph of the second chapter, where he says, In a field of old Walsingham, not many months past, were digged up between 40 and 50 urns, deposited in a dry, sandy soil, not yet a yard deep, nor far from one another, not all strictly of one figure, but most answering uh, this description, some containing two pounds of bones, distinguishable in skulls, ribs, thaws, uh, jaws, thigh bones, and teeth, with fresh impressions of their combustion, besides the extraneous substances like pieces of small boxes or combs handsomely wrought, handles of small brass instruments, brazen nippers, and some kind of Opal. So that's uh, this, this archaeological discovery of the remains of these people long since deceased is the occasion for this. And as one imagines, uh, this is a work then that is much concerned with death. There's not a lot that, that Brown can say because nothing was known 
uh, not a lot he can say about the civilization, the society that produced these relics. But what he does, what he can do, is talk about various burial practices of society, of other societies. And here, once again, he shows himself to be an old-fashioned humanist. He understands the burial practices, and indeed, the uh, most of chapter one is a wonderful survey of the different burial practices of different societies in the ancient world up through the Christians. Uh, different societies uh, burned bodies or exposed bodies. Christians uh, tended to bury them. Um, and uh, so uh, there, is, uh, there is then the fact that the, the, the occasion of urn burial so, close, so neatly fits um, the cast of Brown's own mind. Uh, there's, a, there's a mysteriousness about who produced the urns. That ties in nicely with Brown's view that the world contains mystery. Uh, see his um, emphasis on the supernatural in the Religio Medici. Also, it ties in nicely, or reflects nicely, the, uh, should we say, the humility of Brown's mind, because there are certain things that he cannot know. Uh, and it's a wonderful occasion as well, um, for uh, his magnificent prose, uh, because uh, the, the prose here in the urn burial is so rhythmic, and that rhythm is uh, partly imparted by a sense of the transitory nature of life. The um, work, the occasion, also allows him to draw on his knowledge of antiquities, his knowledge of, of different societies, and also uh, to draw on his understanding of science, particularly of biology. You can see an example of this on page uh, 358, towards the top of the right-hand column, when he is explaining to the uninitiated how it is that the human being, uh, let's uh, take myself as an example, maybe 200 pounds, uh, that a human being can be uh, reduced after death to such a light weight as just a few pounds of bones. He says, how the bulk of a man should sink into so few pounds of bones and ashes may seem strange unto anyone who considers not its constitution and how slender a mass will remain upon an open and urging fire of the carnal composition. Even bones themselves reduced unto ashes do abate a notable proportion. And, con and, and this is, uh, you know, pure chemistry. When uh, heat reacts upon uh, a substance like wood, for instance, that's how you could get a uh, 20 or 25 pound uh, heavy oak log reduced to ashes because so much of the mass or material, he doesn't know this, of course, um, but he understands something about the science. That he understands uh, through scientific observation the effects, um, but that uh, much of the mass of that thing is uh, transformed into uh, heat energy um, and consisting much of a volatile salt when that is fired out make a light kind of cinders although their bulk be disproportionable to their weight uh, when the heavy principle of salt is fired out and earth almost only remaineth observe in sallow which makes more ashes than oak and discovers the common fraud of selling ashes by measure and not by weight some bones make best skeletons, some bodies quick and speediest ashes, and so on. Uh, and then he goes on in subsequent paragraphs to talk about how um, bodies are combustible, and that's, that's why we can get from some animals, we can get certain kind of fats that we use for combustion uh, in candles and that kind of thing. So uh, there is, uh, the work does give ample scope uh, not only to Brown's understanding of antiquities and old ancient uh, human societies and their practices around death and burial, but also sometimes to his scientific understanding. Uh, I would like to turn to the final chapter of urn burial because it really is just a fine meditation on the transitory nature of life and a pondering of the fact of death, and it really does give rise to some magnificent prose here. And I'd like to read a few um, passages from this. If one looks toward the bottom of page 363, bottom of the right-hand column of page 363, the last 
uh, paragraph on that page, what song the sirens sang or what name Achilles assumed when he hid himself among women, though puzzling questions, are not beyond all conjecture. What time the persons of these ossuaries entered the famous nations of the dead and slept with princes and counselors might admit a wide solution. But who were the proprietaries of these bones? Or what bodies these ashes made up were a question above antiquarism, not to be resolved by man, nor easily perhaps by spirits, except we consult the provincial guardians or tutelary observers. Yes, you could even speculate as to the origin of the society that produced this burial, but who these particular bones in this particular urn belong to, there's no way we will ever know. And so there's that wonderful uh, sense of mystery there that Brown touches on in this section. Uh, bottom of, uh, towards the bottom of page 365, another wonderful passage, uh, bottom of the right-hand column of page 365, life is a pure flame, and we live by an invisible sun within us. That's man's spirit. A small fire sufficeth, sufficeth for life. Great flames seem too little after death, while men vainly affected precious pyres, and to burn like Sardana Palis. But the wisdom of funeral laws found the folly of prodigal blazes, and reduced undoing fires unto the rule of sober obsequies, wherein few could be so mean as not to provide wood, pitch, a mourner, and an urn. Right? Uh, be humble. If, if a person... Uh, if a person is going to burn a body, you don't need a gigantic funeral pyre of the sort described maybe at the end of the Iliad with Patroclus uh, or the end of Beowulf with Beowulf's, but just a, uh, just a small, modest um, cremation uh, is what he's talking about there. And then the final paragraph of this work as well, just a wonderful specimen of beautifully rhythmed elegiac prose, to subsist in lasting monuments, to live in their productions, to exist in their names and predicament of chimeras, was large satisfaction unto old expectations, and made one part of their Elysiums, that is, to be long remembered after death in magnificent memorials, uh, was appropriate to pagan antiquity because they had no consolation of life after death. But all this is nothing in the metaphysics of true, that is, Christian belief. To live indeed is to be again ourselves, which being not only a hope, but an evidence in noble believers. Tis all one to lie in St. Innocent's churchyard as in the sands of Egypt. It doesn't matter how quickly or how it takes for the body to decompose. For the Christian, that's irrelevant because what's most important is the eternal life after death, ready to be anything in the ecstasy of being ever, and as content with six foot as with the molas of Hadrian, tabesne cadevera solvat, an rogus chaud refet, says Lucan. Um, as your learned footnote tells you, whether you're burned or whether you're buried alive, it doesn't matter. What matters is the Christian, uh, the Christian certainty of life after death. As I say, a fitting end to a absolutely wonderful writer, uh, cheerful, kind, optimistic, and in touch with the grand stream of Western tradition. Western tradition. And finally, uh, the reason for all of those other qualities, his genuine sympathetic humility.